someone out there, I can't see you guys. I can't, ooh, I gotcha. I couldn't, see, I can't see everyone. So I don't know if there are men out there or not, but hello everyone <laughs> in Zoom world. Thrilled you guys are here. Um, I'll introduce our speakers in just a minute. I think everyone knows me. I'm Ann Farley. I'm the Director of Community Relations for the Ganshorn Suites. I'm actually in my office, not really sitting in our household, but that's what it looks like back there. <laughs> we are an all um, specialized memory care assisted living in PAL. And Deborah's going to tell you a little bit about our, our community opening up in Avon. Uh, we are really designed for anyone who um, isn't really safe living at home anymore, or whose caregivers are um, overwhelmed with the tasks of caregiving. So they might be considering our community um, for placement. We have incredibly high staffing ratios. Our, uh, our medical director is Dr. Doug Ashari. He's the head of neurology at Ohio State Wexford Medical Center. Um, our community is beautiful. It's, um, as you can tell, it uh, looks um, just like the inside of someone's home. So it looks very familiar and feels very welcoming for those living with dementia. Um, if you um, have anyone in your uh, personal worlds or professional lives that um, need to be supported, whether it's their loved one with dementia or they are themselves as a caregiver, please reach out to me. Um, I facilitate all kinds of programs, support groups. We have caregiver events, um, educational programs, lectures, um, and I would love for them to be a part of that. Um, I'm going to let Deborah touch base about uh, Avon, and then we will get started. Yes. Welcome, everyone. I'm Deborah Taylor. I'm Corporate Director of Marketing for the Gantorn Suites. So even though Ann and I have been working very closely together for the last five years in Powell, we are so excited to be opening the Gantorn Suites on the west side of Cleveland in Avon. We expect that we'll be able to go through our licensure process around July 8th and expect that we'll be fully open closer to July 26th. So we have the exact same purpose-built design in Avon that we have there at Powell. And as Ann pointed out, she has the um, household, the main, the heart of our household, as we call, behind her. You can see our living room and our dining area. And what you see behind me is one of our household kitchens. So people always ask us what makes us a little bit different. And there's really three things. First of all, it is our purpose-built design. We know from research that these smaller, more intimate spaces are better for people with dementia because they're more familiar. It's easier to understand and it's easier to navigate. That's why each of the four households that we have within our building um, are dedicated to a different stage of dementia and they all feature their own household kitchen, living room, dining room, den, beautiful outdoor space, uh, sunroom, and um, it really allows our residents to be anywhere within their household that they would like to be. The second thing that makes this a little bit different from traditional memory care would be our focus on staffing and expertise. We staff our caregivers at one to six because we know it's important not only to have enough caregivers, but we also know it's important to have the right caregivers. So we also require that everyone on our team become, if they aren't already, a certified dementia practitioner. We feel that earned credential is the best way to ensure that we are all focused on best practices for caring for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Beyond that, we do have household nurses around the clock, 24 seven. We have a, a clinical coordinator um, over our entire building or a clinical director, if you will, two clinical coordinators who each oversee a neighborhood and a neighborhood each has two households and then our household nursing team. As Ann said, Dr. Douglas Shari, who's a neurologist with Ohio State University, is our medical director in Powell. But up in Avon, we have Dr. May. She is a physician with the Cleveland Clinic. She has a deep background and passion for caring for people with dementia. So overall, we have very much a strong focus on expertise and care for anyone who's living with Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia. Last but not least, uh, what makes us different is our safety and security. We know that's often the number one concern that caregivers have when they have a loved one with dementia. Um, how do you ensure their safety and security? Well, at the Ganshorn Suite, at both of our centers, we have a real-time locating system. So we track in real time all of our residents and our caregivers. Uh, basically, what that means is it really helps us support independence in a population that's struggling with independence due to their memory loss. It enables our uh, residents to be anywhere, again, within those households that they would like to be without having to have a staff member joined at their hip. 
because our team members can see on an iTouch device and also on a workstation computer, we have a map. We can see where every resident and staff member is every minute of the day. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to, again, support that independence while keeping our residents safe. Anyhow, I don't want to uh, hold this up any longer. If you do have any questions about our services um, for either one of our centers, you can reach out to us in the chat. Um, certainly after the program, Ann and I do like to follow up with attendees. We can also email information out to you. But if you haven't already, make sure you check out our website at danshorn.com or follow us on social media. We're pretty active on Facebook as well as LinkedIn. So without further ado, Anne's going to introduce our wonderful speakers who will teach us everything we need to know Yay. about driving in dementia and other dementia related dilemmas. Yay. And you all also in regards to questions, once uh, Beth and Christine start um, speaking, if you have questions, just chat, type them in in the chat box um, and we will, um, you know, kind of pose those questions throughout the program. So we have Beth Minnick and Christine Ranella. They are both with the... Um, they are with the Driver Rehabilitation Program Coordinator at Ohio Health Grady Memorial Hospital. They're both um, occupational therapists along with a lot of other um, initials that I don't know what they are. So maybe they'll tell us about them. We are thrilled that they're here today, you all, because we know that this is, I, I get this question asked all the time about safety at home and when do I know when I need to take the keys away from mom or dad or whoever and you know, what do I do when they start leaving the gas stove on? And, you know, just everything that goes through the caregiver's brain. So um, Christine and Beth are going to talk to us a little bit about that and ways to handle them at home. Ladies, thank you very much. Of course. Hello. Yes. <laughs> um, let me introduce myself. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Beth. Um, I am an occupational therapist. I have been practicing for a little over six years. Um, I originally am from Cleveland, Ohio. So I love to hear about the... Um, new location in Avon, kind of where I'm from. And I received my degree from Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I did my undergraduate and master's program. Um, I have worked in multiple different settings throughout my career, including acute care, um, inpatient rehab, a little bit of home care, and now I am working at an outpatient neurological clinic. And I'm Christine Ranella. The really fun letters after my name are, most of them are specific to driving. Um, but I do have my MBA that I received from Franklin in 2019. Um, I went, I did most of my OT and graduate work at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, by way of a few places also in Cleveland, found my way to Columbus, uh, where I'm born and raised. But I've been with Ohio Health since 2014, um, specific to driver rehab, but I have also worked in the acute care and outpatient settings. Um, all focused on neuro memory and cognition. Mm -hmm. So the other letters after my name, I'm a certified driving rehab specialist and a uh, disability endorsed driving instructor. So that would be the CDI. Mm -hmm. So we'll kind of go into our general overview today of what Beth and I hope to, to bring. Uh, and we'll talk about environmental considerations, medication management, meal prep or kitchen mobility, wandering and elopement risks, signs of elder abuse or neglect, and then aging driver facts and driving conversations, but then also the actual driving evaluation process. Um, Ohio Health does it one way, but I can also talk about how other programs or other places um, approach their evaluation. So I will start out with environmental considerations. And one of the big things that a lot of um, individuals strive for is to call is to what's called aging in place and being able to age within the home that you love, the environment that's familiar to you. Um, again, keeping maintaining that independence, but also finding a safe balance of that. So one thing just to kind of look at overall would be the environment. There's a lot of considerations that can eas easily or, you know, um, be managed or fixed in the house, a quick fix to prevent an unsafe, um, possibly detrimental situation to occur. Um, each year, 36 million falls occur 65 and older. A lot of those falls can be make or break someone's independence and make or break whether they are still able to safely reside in the home or environment that they live in. Um, so one of the things that we kind of look at, first of all, is 
trip or fall hazards, which some of you may have already considered. That's kind of one of the big starting places that we look at as occupational therapists. Um, just to go ahead and give a few examples of fall risks, one would be throw rugs. That's kind of the first one a lot of people kind of think of clutter in general. Um, a lot of people like to have their things that they've collected over the years, things that are important to them, pieces of furniture, um, just like I said, general collectibles, things like that. But how can we declutter the environment to avoid having a, a person, you know, have a, a fall or a near fall or you know, a trip over something that could have been moved out of the way or isn't really necessarily have to be in that part of the home um, or be in the home at all. So another one where I see a lot of um, falls occurring would be just adequate lighting. Um, I think a lot about nighttime toileting. A lot of our, um, as you age, a lot of times the frequency of going to the bathroom, especially during the nighttime hours, can increase. Something as simple as a night light or a sensor activation light, a sensory activation light that would turn on when you get up can be one thing that would make or break someone having an accident or a fall in the middle of the night, um, especially when you're kind of less on your game, you know, in the middle of the night, you're, everything's slowed down, our respiratory rate, our processing speed, all of that. Um, another one I see quite a bit in terms of referrals would be performing a high fall risk activity when you're alone, tired, or under the wrong circumstances. The biggest one I can think of off the bat would be bathing. Um, you know, it might be as simple as let's look into this and think about um, maybe some bath, some shower, a shower chair, a safety rail, or maybe just thinking about having supervision with bathing, um, making sure that there's someone in the home in an earshot or physically in the bathroom if the, if the person is okay with it or comfortable with it, that may make or break a fall. Um, another compensatory strategy that we look at would be organization of the home. If it's a multi-level home, do we have frequently used items in neutral or convenient safe areas that someone can access? Or I've had someone before, if it is a multi-level home, if it's something you're using very frequently, why, if, if able, have multiple of those items and putting them in multiple parts of the home to avoid having to travel up and down the stairs several times a day, again, where that high fall risk uh, location could be. It also could just be something as easy as, forming um, a daily schedule before you even get up, you know, or have your day. Let's make sure we're doing everything that we need to do on the second floor first, and then we're going down to the first floor and we're really not going to go back upstairs unless it's completely necessary and, or until it's time for bed or whatever um, part of the home that you need to access is up there. Um, one thing I'd like to also throw out there too is the potential for to have a home safety assessment. Um, talking to your, sometimes it's as easy as talking to your primary care physician and requesting a referral to a home health occupational therapist to come out and do an environmental screen. It might be something as easy as rearranging furniture. Again, giving one of the su suggestions that I just mentioned, um, durable medical equipment, such as a shower chair, an elevated toilet seat, a safety rail, things like that, um, that you may not have considered before. Again, that can promote safely aging in place. One other thing that um, we talked about as well that's becoming a lot more common is multi-generational homes. A lot of folks are having that in-law suite or living right next door to their family member to allow um, frequent ability to provide those che daily check-ins, whether that be in person um, or you know on the phone, if you're able to form a schedule with your family or the friends that are willing to help and pitch in, you know maybe it's one person goes over at, in the morning, one person calls in the afternoon. Really, you know what works best for you with a rotating schedule in that regard. I've also um, just another example. We had a patient that went home and was concerned about, you know, them having a fall or if something were to happen, how would they get a hold of somebody? You know, just being creative, uh, this patient every morning would open up their living room curtains and that signified to their neighbor, hey, they're awake for the day, they're okay. That's just kind of a little sign that everything's, you know, status quo. Also, we can talk about those, um, uh, what would it be like a life alert, the safety buttons, an emergency button, reviewing with your family member how to use a cell phone, who they would call in an emergency, making sure that that, that mode of um, communication, whether it be a cell phone or an emergency button is 
accessible within arm's reach and if they know how to use it. That's also really important, especially when under duress. Um, so let's go ahead. Another one too quickly um, would be potential for like adult day programming. Um, you may hear it be called adult daycare, um, but there are some, you know, services in the greater Columbus area that do provide the, that, you know, for caregiver burnout or just to provide, again, a safe space for someone to go for a few hours a day, several days a week during those times when family just can't quite, um, you know, make a time to, to make sure that the patient's safer, um, giving that adequate supervision. So the next um, topic I will go into would be medication management. And this is a huge one. Um, the first thing I wanted to kind of talk touch base was the performance skills that are necessary to safely manage medications. And when I say medication management, being able to take you know, pills as prescribed and medications as prescribed, um, you know, cognitively, can the patient understand the medication instructions? Are they comprehending why they're taking the medication? Are they able to apply some of the um, some of the dosage and warnings to their daily schedule, such as, you know, taking food on an empty stomach or not, avoiding sunlight after consumption? Does it make you nauseous or drowsy after medication? Can they apply that necessary information to their daily schedule and, you know, make, making safe choices about that? Um, in terms of the physical performance skills, something, and this may seem silly, but something as simple, can they open the medication bottle? A lot of medication bottles are made to keep people out like children, you know, or to, you know, keep the medication in the bottle. But a lot of pharmacies will also um, have the option of the easy open containers um, or, you know, coming up with different strategies and making sure that the patient has the dexterity and the ability to get the pills out of the container in order to consume them. And also looking at vision as well. Think of those patients that have that, the, or those individuals that have low, low vision. Um, that might be something you overlook a little bit, but the medication labels, they're small, um, sometimes hard to navigate. So go review that with your family member. Talk about the medications, why they're taking them, what, to, when to take them, how many, and what they would do in the event that they weren't able to, um, you know, access the medication or take it appropriately. Um, some of, and when it comes to compensatory strategies for medication management, um, like I had already mentioned, the easy open containers, talk to your pharmacy about that. And then one um, compensatory strategy that a lot of people already kind of know in the clip art I have on here would be a medication organizer. Um, one thing about medication organizers is there's different complexities of those. You can get your very basic seven compartment, one per one compartment per day um, medication organizer. But what about those folks that have, you know, those twice a day medications or um, even three times a day? You can get a very, there's a very wide variety of complexity of pill organizers that you can, you can access. And, you know, in terms of cost effective as well. There are some pricier options, but if you're very concerned, there are ones on the market that do go as far as having a timer and a locked chamber that, dis that dispenses it and will not dispense any more medication after that to avoid double taking double doses of medications or not taking them at all. The alarm will keep going off until the patient has you know, um, taking the medication from the dispenser. And then of course, you know, you could always use the timer on a cell phone um, as, or an alarm or something like that, or, you know, coming up with a way to call the patient and coming up with a, strat a system in that regard, if you're very concerned about the individual not being able to, you know, consume them without help or using those strategies. Um, and then one other, you know, thing I would like to point out are the red flags. So, you know, first would be comprehension. Are they understanding what the medication is? Do they know why they're taking it? Do they, do they feel like they, some patients or individuals may not think they need it at all. They, uh, that insight into the, into the, into the diagnosis and how the, how it's being medically managed is really important to understand. If the individual doesn't understand why they're taking it or feel like it's necessary, that's probably not a great sign in terms of being, um, 
manage, managing it and being taking it appropriately or as prescribed. Um, another red flag would be, as I mentioned, unsuccessful attempts of using those compensatory strategies. You know, we've tried a locked compartment, we've tried a, we've tried a alarm, we've tried calling, we've tried reminding. We've, you know, if those aren't working, then it may be more of a a time to step in and, and really take over that um, take over that task. Um, another red flag would be establishing patterns, um, identifying pattern identification. They're missing doses. They're missing refills. They are unaware that they have one pill left and they didn't occur to them to go refill the medication or didn't feel like they needed to. Um, another huge one that we see quite a bit, you know, in our, in our practice would be a negative medical event directly related to missed medication management. You know, the blood sugar, your blood sugar went completely skyrocketed or, or bottomed out. You went to the hospital for a hyperglycemic episode, or you had a seizure for not take from not taking medication, blood pressure spiked, any of those major issues, you know, if we're not, if the medication's not being taken as prescribed, then there's likely going to be some negative medical um, event related to that. Um, okay. Something that I'll add just mm -hmm. to, as an aside, um, you know, I always like to throw my own family under the bus when I do mm -hmm. presentations. Um, Beth has probably heard all of my family stories, yeah. but we know that cognitive and memory impairments are sometimes not standalone. So a lot of the things that we'll talk about today can also apply to family members as they lose vision. A lot mm -hmm. of these different compensatory techniques or strategies are good with a low vision population or other considerations. Um, and my favorite was my grandmother that lost her sight due to macular generation. And she had to use a pill organizer with an alarm, but then she would sometimes forget what was alarming. So it was uh, its own little battle there as the adjustment was made. Um, but slow changes over time are usually a lot easier to integrate and to use than an immediate shift, you know, kind of ripping a bandaid off. We've done this for so long. Now we're going to do it th this way versus a gradual change over time. So um, the next topic that we have on here would be med, uh, meal preparation and kitchen mobility. So two separate things, um, you know, it's all, we like to think about cooking and everything, but the one big piece I always like to also mention is let's talk about kitchen mobility. What is kitchen mobility? And that is the retrieval transportation and storage of necessary items to cook. So not just following steps for a recipe, but can you physically get in and out of cabinets, the refrigerator, down in those low drawers safely, being able to safely navigate the kitchen. Can you stand standing tolerance, things like that. So when it comes to the performance skills for meal preparation and um, kitchen mobility, we look at cognitive skills, kind of the, you know, the things that this um, presentation is centered around, memory, attention, problem solving, having those basic skills that are necessary to safely prepare a meal, whether that be cold meal preparation or complex meal preparation, which would be more like using the stove, um, the oven, using chopping knives, things like that, that those multi-step um, lengthy meal preparation tasks, as opposed to just, you know, making a sandwich or heating up some oatmeal in the microwave. Um, Again, also looking at vision, certainly. And then when we look at the physical part of that, you know, balance, reaching, functional mobility, endurance. A lot of times, traditionally, when you think about cooking, we're standing at the counter, we're stirring at the stove. That can take a lot of energy, a lot of endurance, a lot of balance requirements to fully start, to make a meal from start to finish and even clean it up afterwards. So um, really thinking about those things and, how can we support the safest way of navigating the kitchen and also preparing the meal? So one, some of the compensatory strategies that I like to talk about um, would be those visual or auditory aids, you know, kind of with medication management, even timers, um, alarms on your phone, for, um, written visual aids. Um, I also written step-by-step, -step, um, a list of step-by-step for you know, making certain meals, um, safety considerations, those sort of things. Um, there's also a lot of adaptive utensils and cooking supplies out there, such as um, you know, if one there are non there's like cut resistant gloves you can purchase if someone is for chopping things. There's adaptive cutting boards that have all sorts of different components on it that support safe meal preparation. 
bowls of suction cups on them to allow stabilization for stirring, um, built up utensils if we're having any arthritis or grip strength issues. Um, you know, another thing we look at is look back to those environmental considerations, putting frequently used items in convenient locations. If it's something they're using quite a bit, it wouldn't really make sense to be putting it up on a very high cabinet or in a really low drawer. Um, that just, again, if we're having balance or endurance issues, that may may create a higher risk of experiencing a fall or um, experiencing a activity tolerance decline throughout the task. Um, I've also looked into if we're having concern, if we're concerned about the patient's ability to use a chopping knife or something like that, buying pre-chopped vegetables, again, um, you know, buying pre partially meals that are already pre-prepared, um, completion of certain tasks from a seated position. Do we have to do this whole activity standing up or can we get, create a little station at a kitchen table to do part of the chopping, um, the meal prep, the stirring, what, what have you um, from a seated position? That's just one little small change that can, you know, help promote energy conservation in terms of endurance. Um, there's also different other food delivery service items. Meals on Wheels is a big one we hear quite a bit, um, you know, where the meals are delivered to your front door, um, warm or for microwaving. I have had patients before as well, you know, separating heavy items into smaller containers. A great example of that would be like a gallon of milk. Do we need a full gallon of milk? Could we buy two half gallons? Can we separate those into smaller containers? Um, and then, you know, if we're having any issues with using the stove, you know, maybe just simply doing something like unplugging it during hours that are not supervised. That can be a big, a big um, way to kind of prevent burns and um, house fires and things of that nature, which brings me to the red flags. So again, unsuccessful attempts of using these compensatory strategies. Look, we've tried to do, we've tried to reorganize the kitchen. We've tried to buy pre-prepared portions of meals. We've tried different adaptive equipment for the kitchen. We've tried to give a written list of things, auditory reminders um, in terms of timers and things of that nature. And they're just, there aren't working. And we're, you know, that would be a good way, a good indicator that possibly, you know, supervision is very necessary for these types of things or a meal delivery service or something like that, or going to a dining room if that's available. Um, another one we see quite a bit, inst um, increased instances of cuts and burns. I have patients, you know, I'll come into the clinic and I'll say, oh, you have a burn on your hand. What happened? They're like, yeah, I took the oatmeal out of the, out of the microwave too early and I burned my hand or wasn't paying attention and I put my hand on the stove or things like that that weren't really a problem that are starting to kind of reoccur, getting little cuts, um, things like that. Um, another huge one would be handling food safely. You know, are we safely handling cooking materials such as raw meat? Are we cooking raw meat thoroughly? I've had a patient before just in terms of memory and attention really wasn't fully cooking food, but still eating it, not realizing it. Um, also inability to determine whether a food is expired. Are we keeping food in the refrigerator that's expired or potentially really unsafe to eat? Uh, that would be a big red flag as well. Um, so dietary constriction or uh, diet, dietary considerations as well. Thinking about the medication management. Um, are we not eating healthfully? Are we not, are we not eating at all? Are we eating on an empty stomach? Are we taking medication on an empty stomach? Are we not following um, recommendations? Maybe a clinical dietitian may have given for diabetes or heart conditions, things of that nature would be, maybe we're not really managing our, our diet and preparing meals that we should be to, to promote health, um, longevity. Uh, another one, the biggest one, I guess, would be in a, inability to effectively operate a stove and any other kitchen appliance. That's the biggest one we hear. Oh, forgot to turn the burner off. Or I forgot something was in the oven. You know, that can be one of the most, you know, one of the most negatively impacting scenarios in terms of safety. It, it could cause, it could result in death, to be really honest. So if we're having instances of that, I think it's definitely time to step in and possibly restrict things to microwaving, unplugging the stove, if you have to fully remove the stove or ensuring that you are there when it's being in use, um, those sort of things. Um, and yeah, that would be, so that's for that one. 
Yeah, and the only other thing with stoves is modern convenience for child proofing things are great. So you can lock mm -hmm. out a lot of the buttons on modern microwaves and stovetops. Um, but for a lot of the older ones, you could consider different switches versus having to fully unplug um, or just pop the knobs off. Mm -hmm. So one um, area next that we're going to talk about would be wandering in elopement. Those patients that, or those individuals, excuse me, that are, you know, maybe wandering around the home, away from their home completely leaving the home and going somewhere else, whether it be by foot, by car, um, and, you know, different compensatory strategies to maybe manage that a little better within the home. I think one of the first things that Christine and I talked about when we were kind of coming up with information for this slide is why, why are they eloping? Why are they wandering? Is there something they want? Is there something they need? Is there something that we could, you know, you could, a quick fix in the home, you know, it's just something as a simple as a phone call or a photo or an item that they want, um, maybe opening a window, allowing them to look outside, they want to enjoy the weather, just kind of trying to get to the bottom of why they're wandering or trying to leave um, their safe place. I think that's a really good place to start because it might be something that is reasonable, like, oh yeah, I would want to, I would want to walk away or leave too if I didn't like that. It could be a noise in the house. It could be a bright light or it's just something that would be easily or reasonably fixed um, or managed. Um, that's kind of a good place to start. And then, you know, different compensatory strategies to manage this wandering or elopement. Um, you know, there's all sorts of technology these days. First, I will go on window, door, chair alarms, you know, there's pretty much anywhere you want to put an alarm, you can. Um, it's something as simple putting an alarm under um, a person's bottom when they're sitting on a chair or in a bed, if they stand up, the alarm's going to go off and you're going to already really know, hmm, maybe they're trying to go to the restroom or, oh, you know, they're getting up, maybe confused. So just something to tip you off in that regard, or the front door is open. Oh gosh, they might be trying to go outside, something like that just could be an easy kind of auditory cue to the caregiver or someone who's providing support to alert them that this person has gotten up from their position that they were, or that they were previously in. Um, Another one we talked about before was the adult day programs. Um, and then I'd also mentioned as well, rotating um, supervision schedules, you know, among family and friends, you know, maybe it's just kind of, you know, it takes a village having someone have a, you know, those two, oh, we'll take two hours today and keep an eye out or, you know, being able to kind of be creative and maximizing the amount of help that you do have among family and friends in order to provide that supervision, whether it be direct one-on-one -on -one, um, from afar, uh, a phone call, um, that is whatever it may be, whatever is uh, the ability of the family and friends helping out. Um, there's another um, option for locking mechanisms. And I know that might seem a little, you know, just you know, locking somebody in, but if they, you can, there's a lot of technology in terms of internal um, locking systems to prevent people from traveling to unsafe areas of the home. Maybe we do not want them going in the basement. We are locking that door, or you know, that's a those stairs are really, really dangerous. Or locking the exits of the home so they simply cannot get out um, it, during you know isolated periods when they don't have someone to prevent them from doing so. Um, Another one would be, you know, visual compensatory strategies. So Christine brought this one onto my attention. It would be a trick door. Um, so making a door that to the basement or an, uh, a very unsafe area of the home, the same color as the wall um, behind it. So that really, you know, if they're having, they're not really able to decipher that, oh, there's the door to the basement. So it might be something as simple as that or covering up the door, putting something in front of it to just, you know, create the illusion that there's nothing there and there's nowhere to go in that part of the home. Um, another um, option would be in-home security cameras with sensor detection. I know a lot of people currently are using them with their pets. They love to watch their pets from, from home and the cage and everything like that. But truthfully, for some, for some folks with the wandering or elopement risks, this may be really useful to pro provide that supervision when while at work or while running an errand, just being able to keep an eye on making sure, okay, they're still napping in bed or they're still watching TV or oh, everything looks okay at home, things are okay, or providing that sensor. They did get up, you know, they're awake, you know, what are they doing? What are they up to? Being able to just kind of keep an eye on them from afar, um, if that is, works for you and your, you know, your family. Um, 
There are also, um, you know, technology again, a lot of tracking applications on the smart on smartphones. I know, for example, um, Apple has one called an AirTag. Um, there's Tile is another brand that can simply, you know, be able to tell you where is this person physically, geographically, kind of tracking them, keeping an eye on where they are. Um, that would be another strategy if you um, if that's something within your means. And then my last slide for me, um, I'll go over, will be just some signs of elder abuse. This is just a brief slide. I think when a lot of people think of abuse, the first thing that comes to mind is physical abuse. And certainly that is a, a very um, noteworthy category, but I think the other categories can also be more overlooked or less noticeable or less, um, you know, that would be less likely to, to notice. So we'll go over these um, physical, obviously that was the first one I had mentioned, obvious bruises, grip marks, repeated unexplained injuries that don't really have a rhyme or reason, um, dismissive attitude about injuries. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. You know, um, that's, those are some red flags for the physical abuse. And when it comes to psychological, um, uncommunicative or unresponsive, the person's more flat, they're kind of in, you know, in a shell, they've kind of, you know, showing those sort of different psychological changes or mood changes possibly um, unreal and back to mood unreasonably fearful or suspicious um, out of nowhere uh, lack of interest in social contact you know maybe those activities or places that they once were super excited and interested in going now it's mm, I don't know I, you know fearful or just kind of avoiding those those areas um, unexplained changes in behavior another one and then we look at just general neglect, um, lack of food and water, basic hygiene. I mean, has, has there been a major weight loss or uh, sunken eyes? Just those changes that show, you know, it doesn't look like their daily needs and, and um, desires are being met, whether that be from food or um, exercise, things like that. And then financially, certainly, you know, especially if someone's trusting in someone else to manage their finances due to a cognitive decline. That's a big, um, big, you know, gamble to allow someone else to manage your finances when you're cognitively unable to. So um, looking at red flags, life circumstances don't match what is known about the person's financial assets. Like things aren't adding up. They're, they haven't gotten new clothes. They haven't been eating. What's going on here? I thought they had means to do that. Um, large withdrawals from bank accounts unnecessarily and randomly um, that don't really have a rhyme or reason, nor the person is able to indicate why that was taken from their account. And then lastly, signatures on checks that don't match the older person's signature. Now, certainly we know with aging, fine motor control and dexterity, um, managing a utensil can change, but you know, if you, if you feel it in your gut, like that doesn't look like their signature, um, compared to have them write a signature and if it doesn't match up then there could be something fishy going on so you know um, if you're suspicious go with your gut look into it and raise more concerns if you feel like any of these are you know, becoming an issue and you know it doesn't hurt to look into it yeah and it can often be hard to identify true elder abuse versus other things because there are secondary considerations um, for example someone that takes blood thinners will bruise exceptionally easily um, if someone suffers from depression or anxiety, the fearful or suspicion can sometimes be there. Um, there are features of cognitive impairment that are illicit with paranoia. Um, so really just identifying those red flags and not being afraid to look into them. That maybe it is true. We, we bumped our knee on the coffee table and that's why we have a nice big bruise on our calf. Um, or we ran into the door jam or hit our funny bone off of something and now we have a, a massive bruise um, where normally there may not be one. All right, so now we get into more of the driving aspect. So I always like to start by having the discussion about age-related change, cognitive impairment. Um, so drivers aged 70 and above do actually have a higher fatal crash rate per miles traveled. Um, it's generally noteworthy that this is related to the middle-aged driver. So we'll say 70 and older versus, I believe the statistic is from 35 to 69. Um, one thing that a lot of times people will combat with is, well, people drive less miles as they age versus teenage and experience. Um, and I think that's the, the point that this statistic tries to make is that even though you're driving less and closer to home, the fatality of the accident is still high. Um, it's also something that I hear a lot in the clinic when I do driving evaluations. Um, 
well, you know, the, the alarm goes off and then I get back into my lane. And I always tell patients that safety features on modern vehicles compared to vehicles even 10 years ago were made to supplement positive driving ability. Um, it's not made to make up for failed driving ability, but just enhance your positive ability. If there's really no ability of someone to self-regulate or be aware of themselves, a lot of times with cognitive impairment, there's a waxing and a waning. Um, you have good days and bad days. Being aware of today's a bad day for me uh, is something that unfortunately this diagnosis does not usually show. Um, Age-related changes or cognitive impairment. So like I said earlier, they sometimes don't live alone in terms of a medical issue. So it's very rare that someone is referred to me with a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or an associated disorder um, that has no other prior medical history. It happens rarely, but sometimes there's underlying medical conditions or as we age, we expect certain decline, uh, but memory loss is really not considered normal aging in the neurological sphere anymore. So we already talked about medications and the management, but some of the side effects can lead to an inability to operate heavy machinery. And contrary to a lot of, we'll say belief, a car is a form of heavy machinery. Um, so medications and their effect on driving, whether it makes someone drowsy or if they require a sleep aid, what time are they taking it? Has it worn off before they try and get in the car the next morning? Um, there was a research study probably about eight years ago now linking Ambien to older females and being overdosed on Ambien because they didn't take into account metabolic reduction in aging adults, but that most of the studies on Ambien were done on men. So the different metabolic aspects that women have, that sleep aid in particular, led to more morning crashes and other features in the female population. So that's one example of many, but it does go to show that the medication and driving aspect is more linked than sometimes you can see. Uh, if someone is unable to take their medications as prescribed, they're double dosing, or they're not taking them at all, you can see what's called polypharmacy, where you have too many medications on board or something is interacting with another medication, causing a dementia-like presentation or confusion, lethargy, a whole host of issues. So really being in tune with what we're taking, who has prescribed it, what is the best amount, and having those conversations with pharmacy to understand medication interaction, but then also the doctor to say, what do we need to be on and what could maybe be reduced or eliminated? Um, I've always told students when, when I'm having shadow students or they're joining our Ohio Health programs, if someone takes more than six medications, it's a red flag for driving. And that's been shown in multiple research studies. Um, obviously, there are a lot of times where you need all of those medications, but the likelihood of polypharmacy is greater after six is what that has shown. Uh, and crash types matter. So one of the, we'll say red flags of driving is making up what's called an unprotected left turn where someone is required to make a left turn when there's oncoming traffic that also has a green light. So it's when you're deciding, okay, well, there are cars coming. I need to make a left turn on this green light, but it's not a green arrow. So if that is the type of crash that someone has had before their referral to a driving evaluation, it's a good indicator that our judgment, our you know, depth perception, our gap assurance may be impaired or even our attention. We're not paying attention. We say, oh, there's a small break. I'm going to make my turn. But by the time they finished it, they've already been struck um, versus a right of way crash. So they're at a four way stop. They fail to stop the whole way or yield appropriately to whomever has the right of way leading to a low, low speed vehicle crash um, in central Ohio. And I know in Avon, they're starting to pop up. I, uh, I actually know Avon quite well. Um, roundabouts, these are new. There's something that a lot of people in the older population are not experienced with. But thankfully for those, they create what are called angled crashes where you have a giant circle of cars and you always enter at the same route that they're going. So instead of head on or T-bone collisions, you're having more angle to angle uh, meeting points, which do typically lower injury related accidents. So one of the things that when we were putting this presentation together, we were challenged with is how do you have a conversation with your loved one or family member, maybe even a parent, um, when you get to experience that fun shift of, well, I'm the child, but I'm also now the caregiver and I'm kind of the parent in this situation. How do you start the conversation for driving? And maybe when it's not so appropriate. So driving requires the ability to react quickly to a variety of circumstances. 
because this a person with Alzheimer's will at some point be unable to drive. And it's true of any progressively declining condition. Um, for the purpose of our presentation today, we'll use the term cognitive impairment. Uh, but planning ahead always eases the tradition or eases the transition. So just like we talked about with other changes, slowly retiring from driving or becoming the passenger, finding alternative transportation solutions is a lot easier when they're not needed, but you're routinely using them so they become familiar before that point actually comes to be. So by starting it, you have to initiate the dialogue. You have to just sit down with them, express concerns, really stress the positives or the alternatives um, and offer them. You know, find one or two, maybe it isn't that third party, but it's, hey, anytime you have a doctor appointment, why don't I just come and go with you? Um, one, so you can get the information, but two, you know that they're, they're being safe from one place to the other. Um, one of my personal favorites is my grandmother, different grandmother, but similar story. Um, my cousins and I all typically get one weekend assigned to us to make sure that she has access to the grocery store and other places um, because she's no longer driving. Um, you really have to appeal to the person's sense of responsibility. Um, how would you feel if someone went out and was unsafe behind the wheel and harmed you or harmed me or a grandchild, another loved one? And just really gauge their reaction to see where they're at in terms of that awareness of safety. Um, address their resistance while reaffirming your unconditional love and support that while you, you love them and you want them to be successful and independent, safety sometimes overrides that. And really understanding and knowing that this may be one of the first of many conversations, um, because unfortunately with cognitive impairment, memory loss is the trademark where they may forget this conversation happened. Um, so having it a few times, unfortunately, might be what needs to happen for that long-term you know, overhaul. And then obviously considering an evaluation by an objective third party. So you've started the conversation, you have a new cognitive impairment diagnosis. Perhaps you say, Let's just be safe. Let's just across the board, check all of our boxes and, and seek an evaluation. Um, I oftentimes will have providers refer from the day of diagnosis or when there starts to be issues that pop up. The hard part is that by the time that that person has become lost or is having car accidents, usually the outcome of an evaluation is quite unfavorable versus if I see someone earlier in the process, I can make slower recommendations. Let's avoid the highways. Let's consider just creating a list of five local places we really want to go. And then eventually getting into what is our final transportation solution and how are we really retiring from that role? Because now we're really not, not able to do so effectively. Oop, I think I skipped one. So things to really address is your mid conversation. Um, and these are things that can, can come up. So potentially identifying one trusted family member or friend um, that I call the no questions asked person, that as soon as they are in the car with them and driving, they might look over and say, John or Sally, it's time. The, this was unsafe. You made me feel quite uncomfortable. I think it's time for you to go through that evaluation because I'm identifying things that are quite dangerous and I don't want you to continue to put yourself and others at risk. Um, whether that be a good friend rather than a family member, especially if it's a spousal relationship, not to strain a marriage, um, where there may already be a caregiver burnout or caregiver burden, um, but also kids a lot of times, if there's a paranoia or we'll say a behavioral disturbance, there becomes this, well, you just want me to stop driving so you can have my car, um, but really making it about the person and their safety. Um, creating a driving contract. So later on in this presentation, there's a resource page with a driving contract that the Alzheimer's Association has put together. And I, I think it's an okay thing to break out occasionally, especially if someone has a background dealing with litigation, legalities, um, but also it serves as a piece of paper that we've talked about this. Here is the proof of it. It could live on the fringe for a few days um, to really let it come into, into their mind and really understand that these changes or these agreements are happening. Um, and gradually stepping into that passenger role. So like we've talked about a few other times, um, making slow changes as opposed to this abrupt yes, no, start, stop type driving atmosphere. Um, so tips to help with this would really be find ways to reduce their person's need to drive. Uh, maybe they have a group event that they go to socially uh, that now somebody just comes and picks them up. Hey, it's on the way. Why don't I just get you and we'll, we'll go together. Um, you know, the, 
there was a neurologist that I once worked with that always said, not driving doesn't mean that you're not socializing or not engaged with what you're doing. It means we need to find alternatives or other ways for you to safely get there and still actively do these things. Um, so have your prescriptions or medications delivered to present, to you know, make one less outing to the pharmacy or to the grocery store. Um, meals delivered, whether that be a safety thing or it's just a little bit more convenient. Um, getting the support of others. So asking your physician to advise the person not to drive or to medically provide reasons um, why it may be unsafe. Maybe they have a balance impairment on top of a cognitive impairment. They've had a prior stroke. Um, other aspects that could be secondary to just the cognitive impairment. Um, and it can be easier to have a team versus feel that you're one-on-one -on -one in the situation. So asking your physician for a prescription to get a driving evaluation or having them actually put it in writing that they don't want them driving. Um, and then using that document to remind them over time not to drive. Having a respected family authority figure, or even if you have a close relationship with an attorney or a lawyer, having them get involved as well, just to, to really show such as like a driving contract, um, why you should or should not do things. And then experiment with ways to distract the person from driving. Uh, mention that someone else should, should drive because the route has changed or there's construction. Well, they put in that big intersection that you hate up at 161 and 33 with all those roundabouts. Maybe, maybe they should drive, they're more comfortable with it. Um, the conditions are dangerous. It's raining, it's dark, it's snowing, um, especially up in Avon. There's a flash snow warning for, for six to eight inches or 12 inches to 16 off the lake effect snow. Um, being mindful of all of those pieces. Um, or you wanna give them a chance to really just enjoy the scenery. So there are roadways and pathways that, that really just are, are nice to be the passenger you can look at. Um, so if you do get to the point that you feel you need to evaluate their driving, um, without seeking the help of a, a professional, you know, sit in the back seat, have someone distract them, whether it be, you know, you're playing with something, something is making noises, and see if they can make an error. Um, really get into if there's any anger or aggressiveness. Um, and if the person does have a tendency to wander, get confused, they can become lost. And that means that you can also do it by car. So we always see those missing person ads. Um, above the highway that says silver Chevy Impala license plate last seen in this area, really informing someone that you don't want them to become that next st statistic or that sign. Um, I know a couple years ago on Christmas, there was a man diagnosed with dementia here in Columbus that uh, became lost and was found all the way on the other side of town. Um, so we'll move forward to obviously when the conversation does not go well, um, because a lot of times there's a big pushback when we talk about general, we'll say cultural norms or generational considerations is in an older generation, I would say 65 and above, there's this traditional aspect that the man drives um, and that the female is the passenger and it's been this way forever. Why are we changing it now? Um, that now we'll say the, the spouse, the partner, the, the male of this situation has the cognitive disorder and the spouse just kind of hopes for the best in the passenger seat. Maybe they're reliant on them for directions, um, things like that is really just be patient and be firm, acknowledge the pain of the change and really appeal to that person's desire to be responsible. Obviously you will get individuals that say, I've been driving for 70 years. There's not a single thing wrong with it. I'm gonna keep doing it and you can't tell me that, that I can't. That's when you maybe ask that respected family authority figure, doctor, attorney to reinforce the message, um, especially if someone's denying or refusing or has forgotten um, potentially the outcome of a driving eval. Um, something that I had a conversation with Beth with about a different patient earlier today is it's legal to own a car but not have a driver's license. So you'll hear horror stories about someone going out and just buying a new car because it was removed from their house. They called a taxi, they bought a new car. Uh, people with cognitive impairment are quite interesting at how they problem solve and can get around things um, with the right level of anger and motivation usually. But um, if, just trying to stay calm, maybe you need to put the conversation on pause and come back to it a different day. Um, if it doesn't go well, ultimately do not blame yourself. Um, provide a, a safe and reliable alternative when you're able to. Uh, so what if the person refuses to stop? And there is something in the chat. Okay, just making sure we don't miss any questions, but um, controlling access to the car keys. Maybe they're not just hung up by the door. 
Uh, maybe they're a little bit more secure in a lockbox or just in an area that they're not familiar. They've moved location. If you can't find the keys, a lot of times you can't get the car started. Um, looking at how to disable the car, remove the distributor cap, remove the battery, starter wire, ask a mechanic to install some kind of kill wire um, that prevents the car from starting unless the switch is thrown. Or um, before we had key fobs, uh, this was one of my favorite recommendations is go to the, the hardware store and have a key made, but have it made reverse so that it looks like the same key, but it actually doesn't start the ignition um, where they just grind the key backwards. Um, so it looks like their old set of car keys. They, they feel like they still have the car key, but they're probably not gonna tell you that the key doesn't actually turn on the car. Um, or just consider selling the car, moving down to a single car, having it, you know, there's a grandson that's learning to drive. Your 1998 Honda would be a great first car for Bobby to borrow to learn in, um, those type of considerations. Um, one piece though, for a lot of times my patients that are a little bit more financially disadvantaged is, Oftentimes selling the car will save enough in insurance premiums, gas maintenance costs to cover any public transportation fees um, or taxi rides that aren't medically covered, but for that socialization and day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so that's something I've heard multiple times over. Uh, so I talked about having some resources and I'm happy to make this available, but through the Alzheimer's Association, there are some general driving caregiving support for dementia, the driving contact contract that we talked about. And then the Hartford, which is the insurance company, puts out really good informational booklets. So there's an at the crossroads booklet, which looks at you know, age related changes in driving, but also your road ahead, which I think is focused on dementia. There might, be, might have said those in reverse, but um, those are both things that are, are really solid to pull up and they're free PDF files you can bring up online. Um, again, happy to share these resources after the presentation. Have about five minutes left, so we will try and get through this. So six general signs of when to step in and when to really put your foot down is recent tickets, accidents, unexplained damage to the car, um, even if it's backing out of the garage and they ding the car on the, the garage door. Looking at confusion over colors, words, or road rules, so forgetting the rules of the road, becoming quite disoriented, stopping at green lights, trying to run red lights, stop signs are not optional, contrary to popular belief. Those are things that would be red, sign, or red flags moving forward. Um, if there's someone that just refuses to drive with others, they say, no, I don't want anyone in the car. I don't think you need to check my driving. Um, that's another red flag, because someone that, you know, unfortunately, if there's nothing wrong, they wouldn't have an issue. Getting lost in familiar places. So a lot of times one simple construction zone pop-up is all it takes for someone to get lost. Um, signs it's time to step in is looking at, you know, rage or road rage, uncharacteristic behavioral responses when driving, and ultimately failing a performance-based driving evaluation like um, what I do, what Beth is learning to do, um, and what a lot of other places with OTs can offer. So comprehensive driving evaluations usually have a clinical aspect and an on-road evaluation aspect. So the clinical part looks at vision, cognition, physical performance, and we use standardized tests and assessments to evaluate your potential risk for vehicle operation, where the on-road we engage the patient in a driver's ed style vehicle, where we're focused on can you follow the rules of the road, what is your likelihood of being involved in a crash, are you likely to become lost while driving, even in familiar or unfamiliar areas? And how's your general problem solving? Can you understand what's happening around you? Put the car in the right lane, follow the basic directions, things like that. So the best question that I get asked is, are you going to take my license? And for definition, no. I make a report to your medical team and it is up to them in the state of Ohio to refer someone to the BMV. So the BMV officially suspends or revokes licensees based on a doctor's recommendation and they conduct medical investigations. Uh, the physician form 2310 is what the doctor fills out to accurately report that fitness to drive. And all my power is, is to provide information to the doctor. I can technically break HIPAA for the greater good to report to uh, the BMV, but usually the doctor is comfortable reaching out. So some general research on dementia and driving um, tend to make twice as many errors as their non-dementia diagnosed counterparts. And those errors, we talked about the unprotected lefts, but um, driving straight and making right and left turns. Dangerous actions occur most with that poor gap assurance for left turns, difficulties with lane usage and choosing the proper lane, 
Stopping distances, attention, decision-making, and following the rules of the road are most commonly why people will fail their driving about. And we did leave some time for questions, but I don't know that any came up in the box, uh, but I'll move on um, just to, whoop, there we go, to our last slide. Man, I felt like I was, I felt, I felt like you all were sitting in half of my conversations I have with caregivers. I mean, really, I don't mean that to sound smart alecky. I just, I can't imagine how many of our caregivers are in those, in those positions. And it's so hard. You want so badly to keep dignity for these folks living with dementia or even just older adults in general that don't even necessarily have dementia. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's just a, it's a tough spot to be in. Yes, definitely. I always joke that if you come for a driving eval, you're allowed to hate me because you won't likely see me again. Um, don't hate your wife. Don't hate, don't hate your doctor. Oh. You did it for your own benefit. So. Oh, I know. God. Any other questions out there, you all? There's so much good information. Oh, my goodness. So, Christine and Beth, if people want, um, you know, if they want to, um, come to you all for for a driver's exam. How do they do that? What what do they do? Do they need a um, an order from their doctor? How does that work? Yes, it's actually funny. There was a slide for that, and apparently I did not pull up the most recent oh, um, yes. PowerPoint. So I'm happy to email this out. But the uh, driving Perfect. evaluation locations we have one in Upper Arlington, which is in Central Ohio, one in Delaware, north of the city, and then one actually in Mansfield, a lot closer to you in Avon. But I know there are alter alternatives closer to Avon than us. Um, that are just as good. But the process usually goes that someone from their physician would ask for a referral for a driving evaluation, just like a normal referral for a therapy or for some type of outpatient service. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and that's usually specific to the right driving evaluation or OT drive eval, something of that sort on it is okay. good enough for us. And then just make sure that we have some form of a diagnosis or the medical record to review. Um, and that's all we need to get scheduled is if we have anything else come up, we usually contact you for it. So, all right. Yeah. Christina, Beth, if you could send me that and the, um, the resource slide, I took a picture of it, but, um, it would be neat to have that as well. Cause I bet that's got some great information in it and then I'll send it out to the participants. And our email addresses, our work email addresses, I believe are yes. included within, uh, within one of the slides. Yep. Please feel Perfect. free to email us. Um, you know, we, we are more than happy to answer questions via email and, you know, things come up later, like, oh, I forgot to ask about this. Right. What right. Can you? So that's totally cool. That's wonderful. Anyone else have any questions? Hi, uh, everybody. My name is Amy Peacock. I really appreciate hearing some of this information. We are in the process of going through that with our mom. And so um, COVID was awful and a gift because there wasn't anything opened. And so it was, and with the snow and all that. So there's been kind of that natural transition of her not driving, but having this language as things are opening up is really helpful to kind of, yeah. see and, and especially the option of getting an assessment. So we've been using some of that language, but this was really helpful to hear as you know, the conversation come up, but it's just down the street. I can do that. Why can't I do that? You know, and then right. other yeah, it's just hard. It's a really hard yeah. conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't envy patients and families when they have to have this conversation. And I do this for a living. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amy. I'm so sorry you're going through that with your sweet mom. Mm -hmm. mm. Who else? Anyone else have questions? Well, we've got two experts right here in our backyard. Yeah. Well, Christine and Beth, I cannot thank you enough. Your information was invaluable. Um, and like I said, for those of you that are on, um, we're gonna we're gonna bring them back again probably in the uh, early fall because I feel like their information is just that critical. Um, so if you missed it or you want to see it again or there you know you got sidetracked, we're gonna have them back and obviously you all will will know about that. So thank you so much everyone who's on here. Have a great safe weekend. And Christine and Beth, thank you so much. Of course, thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye.